Gary Shaniger, fundador y CEO de Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. Es reconocido internacionalmente como líder en la formación de emprendedores. Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative, ELI, es una organización dedicada a ofrecer programas educativos en el tema de emprendimiento para individuos y organizaciones de todo el mundo. De acuerdo con ELI, la mentalidad emprendedora ofrece un marco de pensamiento que expone al individuo a nuevas oportunidades. Además, esta mentalidad fomenta el pensamiento creativo y crítico, la colaboración, la comunicación, la solución efectiva de problemas y el trabajo en equipo, habilidades esenciales para el mundo actual. Es coautor del libro Who Owns the Ice House? Eight Life Lessons from an Unlikely Entrepreneur. Bestseller, descrito como una lectura obligatoria para la humanidad. El libro trata acerca de la historia de un hombre ordinario cuya habilidad sobrepasó sus circunstancias y le permitió llegar a tener una mejor vida. Basado en su propia experiencia, el nominado al premio Pulitzer, Clifton Tolbert, se unió con el líder del pensamiento emprendedor Gary Shaneke para crear una cautivadora historia que captura la esencia del pensamiento empresarial y las posibilidades ilimitadas que éste puede brindar. Con ustedes, Gary Shaneke. Hola. How are we doing? Great. I apologize so I don't have a uh, good enough Spanish to conduct this presentation in Spanish. Please bear with me. I've got about 45 minutes. What I'd like to do is I'd like you to leave here in 45 minutes thinking a little bit differently about what it means to be an entrepreneur. I want you to think a little bit differently about who can be an entrepreneur and why we should be more entrepreneurial. So most of you don't need me to explain to you the, that the world is changing and it's changed rapidly. It's changing at an unprecedented rate. I found this um, interesting little graph recently in a book by the author Thomas Friedman in his newest book called Thank You for Being Late. And he's interviewing um, the head of Google technology that's in charge of, his name is Eric Teller. He's the CEO of Google who's in charge of the robotic uh, driverless cars. And what he's saying is that the rate of technology that Moore's Law And the, the, the rate of technology is accelerating at a rate that is going to surpass or has surpassed our own capacity to adapt to this rate of change. And this is where we are today, that, 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 the, that the rate of change has exceeded our ability to adapt. I'm not saying this. I'm saying this is what the head of Google technology is saying. There's some other important indicators that, in the, uh, uh, that the world is changing. There's a fundamental shift occurring. The head of human resources at Google is saying that academic scores, grade point averages, are worthless as a criteria for hiring at Google. Students are not engaged. For the educators that are in the room, you don't need me to explain this to you. This is Gallup's research from the United States demonstrating what they refer to as the student engagement cliff. The lack of engagement as students go from elementary to middle through high school, their engagement drops off precipitously. This is a, another little fun fact that I found from the Gallup's research on worker engagement. 87% of workers around the world are not engaged in their work. 87%. The vast majority of humans on this planet are not engaged in their work. So, you know, I, I really can't quite understand why people aren't freaking out about this statistic. Right? Look, look at, let's look a little bit closer here. 
They break it down like this. Approximately one in four is actively disengaged. This Google, uh, excuse me, um, Gallup describes as people who are likely to spread negativity among the workplace, about one in four. About two thirds are just not engaged. And Gallup describes this as people who are not likely to make any meaningful contribution to the organization's goals. And what we're left with is 13% are actively engaged. So what we want to figure out is why. Who are these people that are so actively engaged? I would argue that among those who are actively engaged, there's a smaller subset that are hyper-engaged. These are people that are very resilient, they're agile, they're self-directed. They're able to identify and solve problems without anyone there to tell them what to do. They're resilient, they're creative, they're critical thinkers, they're resourceful. Who are these people? These are entrepreneurials. And I'm using the term entrepreneurials for a very specific reason. It's sort of a tongue in cheek play on the idea of millennials. But the entrepreneurials aren't beholden to any particular generation or moment in time. What's common is their attitude, their mindset, which I'll talk about more in a moment. But I would also like you to think about the entrepreneurials beyond just people who are starting a business. We can own a business and not be entrepreneurial. We see these every day, right? And by contrast, we can be very entrepreneurial but not own the business. So this is the term, these are entrepreneurials. They're in, in, they work within existing organizations and they create new. So we all understand that entrepreneurial people are more likely to, to generate economic growth to create jobs, but there's more to it than that. Entrepreneurials, are they're, they're improving the quality of our life. They're, they're, they're making greater contributions to to the environment, to our to existing processes process, uh, and procedures. Like in, in our everyday lives, they're solving problems. I found this paper published recently by the World Economic Forum saying that entrepreneurship education is essential for developing the human capital necessary for the society of the future. So what we're seeing are policymakers business leaders, academic leaders, beginning to recognize that entrepreneurship is more than a business discipline. It's not just about starting a business. It's an essential skill that every student will need, every person will need in order to survive and thrive in the 21st century. Academic leaders have begun to make the connection to understand that students who participate in entrepreneurial courses have higher academic achievements. There's a correlation. Uh, 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 entrepreneurship is not only a 21st century workforce skill, but it's also linked to higher academic achievement. I want to draw your attention to this particular line I found in a paper published by the World Economic Forum, in which they stated that it's not enough to add entrepreneurship on the perimeter, that it needs to move, to, it needs to shift to the core of the way education operates, right? It's not enough to have an incubator somewhere on the corner of the campus where the, all the hacker tech kids can sit around and create, you know, new apps on their computers. We need to infuse this way of thinking into the core of the curriculum. It's a great idea, it's a great theory, but the question becomes how do we do this? Right? That's one of the questions I want to dig into this afternoon. How do we bring entrepreneurship from the perimeter to the core? Remembering that not every student wants to start a business. Not everybody is interested 
in starting a business, right? So how are we going to do that if we can't make everybody into a business owner? For all we hear today about the word entrepreneur, the concept of an entrepreneur or entrepreneurship is still widely misunderstood. It's fraught with popular uh, misconceptions, uh, uh, mythology, and misunderstanding that's keeping us stuck on the perimeter. What do you think of when you hear the word entrepreneur, right? Very often you hear of these big Silicon Valley giants that come up with ideas. You know, Mark Zuckerberg comes up with an idea in his dorm at Harvard, moves out to Silicon Valley, gets billions in funding, and now, you know, we have Facebook. And, and this is a model that sort of dominates our consciousness, this uh, image of the entrepreneur. And, you know, our work takes me around the world in working with universities. And what we see on campuses around the world is some version of this Silicon Valley model, right? Encouraging kids to come up with ideas and pitch a venture capital investor. So I came up with a new term. It's called SVCD, Silicon Valley Cognitive Disorder, right? What a behavioral economist would refer to this as what you see is all there is, right? We open a newspaper, we look at social media, and we think, okay, that's what an entrepreneur is. It's a technology kid at Stanford or Harvard, access to venture capital, a big idea, right? We need high growth entrepreneurs. The challenge is it's just not representative of a typical entrepreneur story. So if we wanted to teach all students about being financially responsible, why do we keep showing them lottery winners as examples, right? So I work with the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City and the folks at the research department there explained to me that in the United States, approximately 500,000 new businesses are created each year. It sways you know, back and forth around that range. That's how many of them are started with venture capital investment. A tiny, tiny fraction of a single percent. So clearly there's a, there, there's a, a visibility versus representation issue at hand here. But the damage from this way of thinking about entrepreneurship, it very often teaches young people to think about entrepreneurship as if it's a lottery. I just need to create the right app so I can make a lot of money quickly. And that's not doing a, a, a disservice to what it really means to be entrepreneurial. Many people hear the word entrepreneur and they think of a small business owner, someone who's gonna open up a little shop somewhere. And what we see here is a tendency to conflate entrepreneurial skills with managerial skills. You want to open a business? Great. We're going to teach you how to be a small business manager. We're going to teach you about finance and legal and marketing and sales and accounting and what kind of permits you need and what kind of, you know, all, all these mechanical managerial things. My point is really simple here. You know, managerial skills are important for managing a business, but they're not entrepreneurial skills. And what we've done in our work is we've we, we sort of disentangled the entrepreneurial from the managerial, and that's where the big aha really began to occur. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Some people hear the word entrepreneur and they think of, of, of this, right? Some evil, greedy business guy, right? Someone who wants to exploit others for his own gain. But, you know, really, when, you, when, it, when it comes down to we, we, we did we've done a lot of research and looked at what entrepreneurs are actually doing. In 2008, I went to work for the Cisco Entrepreneur Institute in San Jose, California. And they hired me to do a gap analysis and look at the entrepreneurship education ecosystem and see what's happening here. Where are the gaps? And what we found is a significant disconnection between what entrepreneurs are actually doing 
and the way it's being characterized in classrooms and colleges, universities around the world. That's a problem we want to fix. More importantly, when we look beneath the surface at what the entrepreneur is actually doing, there's a very compelling story there. There's lots of important things to be learned. So one study we found while doing this work at Cisco was done by a guy at Harvard named Amir Bidet, and he looked at several hundred Inc. 500 startup companies. And these are three of them were in his study, Walmart, um, Microsoft, and Hewlett Packard. And what he found is that even large established companies have humble, improvised origins. And that even entrepreneurs like Sam Walton and Bill Gates initially set out pursuing highly uncertain niche opportunities that are obvious to no one. They don't have much money. They don't have much experience. They don't really know what they're doing. Somehow they managed to succeed. So here's the typical profile. This is done from a study of about 200 of the fastest growing companies in the United States, including Wasteman, excuse me, including Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, and Walmart. Right? Here's how it looks. There's no big idea. Right? There's no breakthrough technology. There's no intellectual property. The entrepreneurs themselves aren't spending much time writing formal business plans, nor are they doing formal market research. The median startup capital for one of these Inc. 500 companies like Microsoft or Walmart or Hewlett Packard is about $10,000. And it's not coming from institutional investors. It's coming from friends and family and fools and, and credit cards and second mortgages. It's all patched together, right? Here's what's most astonishing. The entrepreneurs in this study... 40% of them had no experience in their chosen field, none whatsoever, no experience. So I want you to pause for just one second and look at the screen and ask yourself how. No big idea, not much planning, not much research, not much money, not much experience. How does the entrepreneur turn that circumstance into an Inc. 500 company, into a successful, sustainable endeavor that's bringing value to society? Take a moment. This turns our logic upside down. It doesn't make any sense. And this is where I think that many of us make what a social psychologist would call a fundamental attribution error. Right? We assign the wrong cause to the effect. So this is the question we set out to answer. How does an ordinary person who doesn't have any of these big ideas, venture capital, lots of experience planning and so forth, how do they succeed? This is what I want to talk about for a few minutes. One of the things we found is that you can't really look at one piece of the puzzle. We have to look at the whole thing. We have to understand the entrepreneurial process. We have to look at the person and we have to look at the situation. If we eliminate any one of those, we'll not understand the whole story. So to talk about the entrepreneurial process, I want to dive into something uh, uh, for a moment here called transformation theory. It was developed by a guy named Dr. George Land, who used this theory to explain the nature of change within any living system. And this is quite useful not only to help, um, help us understand entrepreneurship as distinct from management, but also it provides a good contextual diagram to help us understand what's happening in the world. So transformation theory looks like this, right? There are three phases of life in any system. There's a search phase, there's a growth phase, and then there's an obsolescence phase. And what Dr. Land is saying that while each of these phases are unavoidable, the trick is uh, that to understand which phase you are in, because each phase requires separate rules for survival. So the rules in phase one don't apply in phase two and vice versa. And that's where we, we, get, in, where we, where we get in trouble, right? So he wrote a book about this called Breakpoint and Beyond. If any of you have listened to Sir Ken Robinson's famous TED Talk or his sketchboard, he talks about this research from Breakpoint and Beyond, which is where I found this. 
These little orange dots are, are breakpoints. These are the moments in time when the rules for survival change. So let's talk about phase one and the search phase, right? What are we searching for? As humans, we're searching for a connection with our environment, right? And one way that we connect with our environment is by figuring out how to create something useful for our fellow human beings. Right? That's one way to connect. But we're not really taught this in school. Our parents don't teach us this. School doesn't teach us this. This sort of comes to the essence of an entrepreneurial mindset is that it's my responsibility to figure out how to bring my talents my abilities, and, and solve problems for other people. Sort of the genesis of an entrepreneurial mindset. So before I get into some of the attitudes, behaviors, and skills that are required to search for this intersection between what we know about or care about and what other people need, you might just call it searching for a problem-solution fit, I want to talk about the context, the environment, the situation within which the entrepreneur searches. And I use a yellow bar here to demonstrate lots of uncertainty and lots of ambiguity, right? Highly ambiguous, uncertain environment. And the little green square represents resources. Lots of uncertainty, very little resources. Now, this is not incidental or accidental. It happens to optimize the environment. It creates an optimal situation within which to search. The resource constraints, the ambiguity, create an environment in which you might be more likely to try things you wouldn't try if you were a so-called expert. You all know innovation most often comes from outsiders. It doesn't come from within, right? The light bulb is not the result of continuous improvement of the candle maker, right? The lack of resources creates an urgency and also a willingness to try things that you might not be willing to try if you have lots of money in the bank. So, Generally speaking, the search process requires searching skills, observation, inquiry, experimentation, adaptation, problem solving, collaboration, teamwork. Are these skills beginning to look familiar? These are the skills that every educator on the planet has identified as the skills essential, 21st century skills essential for anyone to survive and thrive in the 21st century. Some version of these skills, they're search skills. They're skills that anyone can learn to develop. They're skills that most of us haven't had much of a chance to practice. So once we find this connection with our environment and we have evidence that there's a connection, and the evidence usually comes in some form of currency, not always, we have evidence that we've created something useful. People are talking about what we've created. They're paying for it. They're telling other people about it. We have some kind of evidence that we've created something useful, right? What most people fail to understand is the entrepreneurial process is evidence-based. It's the scientific method. It's nothing more complicated than that. Once we find the connection with our environment, now it's time to stop searching and start growing. And this is where the managerial skills become very important. This is where planning becomes important, right? Many entrepreneurs, you know, I've spent the last 10 years traveling around the world interviewing entrepreneurs. And very often I hear the same story that you all heard yesterday from Dean Kamen. No intention of being an entrepreneur, he discovered something that people wanted and needed. And then the business, the need to create a business came from there. Right? Many of the entrepreneurs we, we've interviewed, they, they don't self-identify as entrepreneurs. So the managerial skills, I also want to point out that, you know, what, what's, what's happening here is the system stops searching and starts replicating what it found in the first phase so the system can grow, right? These are managerial skills. This is more about management, organization, replication, processes and procedures, the division of labor comes in. The system replicates what it found in phase one in order for it to grow. 
what's happening is the uncertainty is coming down because we're starting to know why people are using this, why they're buying it, why they're, they see value in it. And so the resource access is going up. Inevitably, a second breakpoint occurs because the environment changes. Shift happens. And this is where we so often get into trouble. The system is enjoying this period of growth, and we begin to recognize that we're hitting, that the growth is slowing. It's not obvious. We don't wake up one day and say, oh my goodness, the environment has changed. It's not obvious. And very often, we don't recognize there's a change until it's too late. When our neighbor loses his job, we don't, we, it's very difficult to tell if that's part of a larger trend or if our neighbor just got a bad deal. But inevitably, the environment changes, the situation changes. Right? That's how we know we hit the second break point. The growth starts, the, the growth starts to slow. Right? So this is when we move into the obsolescence phase. Is this sounding familiar? Has anyone worked in an organization where this is happening? So what Land is saying is that ideally, in a perfect world, that we recognize that the world is changing, the environment has changed, and we begin a new S-curve. Right? In, the, in the era of my parents, they lived through one S-curve in their entire life. They went to school, they got a job, they worked in the same organization, they retired, they fade into obsolescence. Now... You know, two-thirds of students who are entering school today are going to work in jobs that haven't even been invented with technologies that haven't even been invented yet, right? We'll go through many, many of these cycles. But very often we run into problems. We go into denial. We, we, we don't recognize the change in the environment. And that is very often a, 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 a because of the, we've enjoyed this period of growth and we now have access to resources, right? And the uncertainty is gone. So we start walking around thinking, I'm Kodak. We know we're the film people. We know everything there is to know, right? And this arrogance and denial creeps in and blinds us to the change that's happening all around us. It happens over and over and over again, right? We wait too late to figure it out. In a large organization, let's just say, you're lucky enough to figure it out, to recognize that we have to change. And this is where sort of the MBA thinking comes in. This is where we bifurcate or innovate. This is about large-scale innovation. This can no longer be an individual entrepreneur or a few little founders off in the weeds pursuing a highly uncertain niche opportunity. The organization has grown and now needs to make these big, bold bets, right? There's lots of cars in the parking lot now. They need to see an idea that can generate $50 million in revenue in three to five years, or they don't even want to hear about it, right? They can't afford to tease out these little opportunities. So basically what I'm saying is very simple. This Second column is the world that most of us have been born into and, and, and have been functioning in a phase two paradigm for most of our lives, right? We, we expect to go to school, to work within an established organization where the rules are well known, the path is well known. We expect to fulfill a predetermined role in an established organization. I like to tell the story of uh, David Foster Wallace uh, his commencement address, and he talked about these two young fish swimming along one day, and they encounter an old fish. And as they're passing, the old fish says, good morning, fellows, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on, and eventually one of the young fish looks at the other one and says, what the heck is water? Right? That's the water we've been swimming in, and we don't recognize, you know, the, the broader the entrepreneurial paradigm. Very often we confuse, like we try to take the principles from large-scale MBA kind of managerial thinking and apply it to entrepreneurship, and it doesn't work because we don't recognize the contextual differences in the situation and the environment. It 
It's very different from the entrepreneurial context. So I like to use this transformation theory graph to not only help people recognize where are we as individuals in our S-curve, in our life, in our career, in our growth, but where are we as a country, as a society, as a civilization in that curve, right? Have we recognized that the environment has changed and that we too must change? Or are we going into denial and thinking, you know, we just keep doing what we've always done? So the entrepreneurial process, I think, can be defined very simply as a discovery process. It's no more complicated than that. It's a discovery process that requires discovery skills. These are skills that anyone can develop. They're skills that most of us have just never had a chance to develop at home. Like any other skill, it's repetition and feedback. The great business thinker at Harvard, Clayton Christensen, said, we're really good at teaching delivery skills. So call them two skills. We're really good at delivery skills. What students need now are discovery skills. So I want you to just think of the entrepreneurial process as a discovery process. Not everybody wants to start a business, per se, but who doesn't want to discover an opportunity? So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the entrepreneurial person. When we see these great entrepreneurs, they're often framed as if they're exceptional individuals who are born with some unique genetic disposition that enables them this magical powers, like they got sprinkled with some sort of genetic pixie dust that enables them to do these mystical. We, we bow down to them and we look at them as if they're exceptional people. So in our work, what we've done is we've dug below the surface to understand their mindset. What are the underlying beliefs and assumptions that influence their behavior? And that's where the real learning began to occur. So once you understand the entrepreneurial process, it's quite simple. It's discovery. You're searching for the, you know, a problem-solution fit. You're searching an environment where there's no rules, where no one's in charge, and no one's coming to the rescue, right? There's no boss to tell you what to do. The answers aren't in the textbook on page 243. You've got to solve problems on your own when no one's coming to the rescue. As a result of that process, you will develop specific attitudes, Beliefs and assumptions, a mindset that perpetuates the behavior. So we looked at this work from a guy named Edgar Schein. He was at, um, at MIT. And Edgar Schein studied culture, and he helped us understand to think about the mindset like an iceberg. On the surface, we have the visible artifacts, the behavior, what we can see and touch with our own eyes. At or below the surface are, um, you know, the knowledge, our explicit knowledge and our espoused values, what we say we believe, the knowledge we know that we have. But what Dr. Shine taught us is that the real source of our behavior is, at the, is, is way deep. It's largely held, taken for granted beliefs and assumptions that are not easy to tease out. And they're particularly, particularly difficult to see in ourselves. These are deeply held, largely unconscious, both individual and collective beliefs, cultural beliefs, that are the true source of our behavior. So here's some of what we've observed in the entrepreneurs, right? As a result of being in an entrepreneurial domain, as a result of pursuing a goal in the absence of authority, without clear rules, and without someone coming to rescue them. The entrepreneurs, they tend to have a higher sense of self-efficacy or perceived self-efficacy, what a psychologist might call mastery. Entrepreneurs tend to have an internal locus of control. They're operating on deeply held, largely unconscious assumptions 
that no one's going to do this for me. I have to figure it out. Right? They tend to have what Carol Dweck at Stanford refers to as a growth mindset. Right? Those with a fixed mindset believe that, that their abilities come on, they're, they're born with abilities and there's nothing they can do. And these are people that seek to avoid risk because they want to avoid embarrassment. A person with a growth mindset has a, a, a learning goals and they're willing to take risks and try and they tell themselves, if I try harder and learn more, I can grow and I can improve. These are the things that remain constant of the entrepreneurs that we've interviewed. They tend to be intrinsically motivated. You know, while most of the world is posting things on Facebook like, oh, God, it's Monday. You know, I don't want to go to, this is how much coffee, this is me on Monday with coffee. Whatever. And then, you know, oh, thank God it's Friday. When you talk to the entrepreneurs, they're saying the exact opposite. They're saying, thank God it's Monday. Right? They're complaining because there's only 24 hours in a day. Right? Because they are intrinsically motivated. If you think that entrepreneurs are motivated only by money, you're missing the point. Right? Intrinsically motivated people, the task itself is the reward. What happens to a human being when their work becomes a source of intrinsic value and joy and satisfaction? You get a highly engaged individual. I can't talk about intrinsic motivation without talking about extrinsic motivation. The extent to which carrots and sticks, gold stars, letter grades, or dollars undermine our ability to develop intrinsic, to become intrinsically motivated, right? Our systems of education are predicated on a piece of paper. If you want this piece of paper, on, on extrinsic motivation, right? Without realizing it, we're unwittingly undercutting or undermining students' ability to be intrinsically motivated to have that kind of motivation. Lastly, we see that entrepreneurs are highly resilient. They tend to have an optimistic explanatory style. They spend a tremendous amount of time in a state of what the psychologist Anders Ericsson refers to as optimal challenge. They're constantly being challenged and having to solve problems on their own. They're constantly getting out of adverse situation and they become highly resilient as a result of this. The studies on resilience and its effect not only on the mind, people who develop uh, uh, optimistic explanatory styles, resilient people have lower all-cause mortality rates. It's, it's, a, it's a perception of, of, uh, that comes from experience. It's not something they're born with. And this brings me to this last thing that I want to talk about is the situation, right? All of those mindset concepts I just talked about are in effect rather than the cause of the behavior. I was talking with some folks just a few minutes before I got started that word entrepreneurial mindset has become very popular, but most people have it backwards. They don't really understand it, and they think you have an entrepreneurial mindset, and that's why you behave entrepreneurially. It's the other way around. So let's talk a little bit about the situation, right? We're very honored to have uh, Tony Wagner from the Harvard uh, Innovation Lab on our advisory board, and this is one of his favorite quotes um, that, you know, we've created, in the past, we've created innovators and entrepreneurs by accident rather than by design, Right? The four entrepreneurs I showed you a few minutes ago all, were all college dropouts. It's one of the things they all have in common, right? We're creating entrepreneurs by accident rather than by design. So how do we create entrepreneurs on purpose? We have to look at the hidden curriculum. We have to look at the way our systems of education are unwittingly organized in such a way as to discourage or inhibit the development of entrepreneurial attitudes, behaviors, and skills. So now I'm going to answer this question in about four minutes. This is what the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative does. We create curriculum, we consult with educators around the world to create entrepreneurial culture and curriculum for colleges, universities, high schools all around the world. You heard about the book that I wrote in 2010 with 
uh, uh, my co-author, Clifton Talbert. It's a story about a man in the Mississippi Delta, has no resources, not allowed in the bank. He's got a fourth grade education. He manages to become an entrepreneur. What the book is really is a distillation of 200 hours of interviews with entrepreneurs from around the world. The eight life lessons are these constant themes that remain constant throughout all of these interviews. It's put into a story, but it was developed into a curriculum that's now gone all over the world, been recognized all over the world to imbibe students, to immerse students in basic entrepreneurial experiences so they can develop uh, basic entrepreneurial con competencies, understand and embrace an entrepreneurial mindset. This program that we created from our work and this research has been recognized recently at the United Nations General Assembly in New York City. About two years ago, we presented at a papal council for peace and justice at the Vatican in Rome. In March, just this past March, I, I had the privilege of presenting our work to a, a to the European Commission in Brussels. And now what I'm really, really excited about, if that's not exciting enough, what I'm really excited about is our work is going to be presented right here. Right? Yeah. Right? Thank you to the leadership and the foresight and the vision of the leadership at Prepa Tech. 9,000 six-semester students will be immersed in this course uh, starting in January this year. Yeah. So as part of our work with Prepa Tech, we've trained more than 200 educators across the system on three campuses about what it, how they can embrace an entrepreneurial mindset and bring these principles into the classroom. This is a training that Bree and Pilar and I did last June um, here in Mexico City. So I want to close with a story. You know, one of the things that I've been doing when I was here is interviewing Mexican entrepreneurs. Right? And I came across this kid named Julian. Right? Julian, you know, this interview with Julian, there's so much to dig into. Um, but I'll, I'll just tell you one thing that, that I... Julian has developed a technology. He's working on a technology to detect breast cancer. This technology can be inserted in women's clothing in a bra so that can detect breast cancer. I should tell you that Julian started on this project when he was 15. He's now 17. He's in his fifth semester right now at PREPA. Julian has a strong why. He was raised by a single mother who had breast cancer and a double mastectomy. And Julian said to me, you know, I asked him in my interview, I said, Julian, are you a good student? I mean, a 17-year-old, 15-year-old kid starts researching breast cancer. Are you? And I thought he was, must have been some kind of a, you know, great student. And he said, twice I was almost removed from school, once for poor conduct and once for poor grades. So he was telling me I'm an average student, right? And he started looking on the internet about understanding what are the remedies, what are, what are the detections, what's, what, where is the technology. And he was just holding these ideas in his head. He was asking himself, why, why not, and what if? And he took a robotics course and connected with an idea in the robotics course. And now he's got one of Latin America's leading oncologists on his advisory board. Right. Now, Julian taught me to think about young people in a different way. He really challenged me. I mean, I, you know, I kept shaking my head in this interview. You're only 17. Right? He said to me, the only difference between me and anyone else is I just refuse to give up. I don't have any intellectual advantage over anyone else, no financial, no other advantage. I just refuse to give up because I care about the outcome. Right? What Julian taught me is that we need to rethink about our predisposed ideas about what young people are capable of. For those of you who are so inclined, look up this concept of the Rosenthal effect and the, uh, the unconscious impact our expectations have on our students without our awareness. Right? Now, we've created sort of an uncomfortable problem for ourselves with Julian. And I want to point out one more thing about Julian. 
So there's a, a, a tech-wide system. More than 100,000 a, a students in the system, but a tech-wide contest. The whole university and the, 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 the high school kids have a contest, an entrepreneur contest. Guess who won? Julian. He beat out all the college kids. 17-year-old right? kid in his fifth semester. Now, the problem we've created for ourselves is we interviewed Julian and inserted this video interview of Julian as one of the Mexican case studies that's built into the curriculum. Now, unfortunately, Julian's going to take the Ice House Student Success Program, the Entrepreneurial Mindset Program, next semester, and he's one of the featured entrepreneurs in the program. This is going to be awkward for Julian. So, this, you know, the answer is quite simple. You know, we don't have to burn, down, burn the building down. We don't have to fire all the teachers. We just have to look at our deeply held, largely unconscious assumptions. And we're no longer educating children to become employees. Let's stop asking them what they want to be when they grow up and start asking them what problems, like Julian, do you want to solve? And what do you need to learn in order to solve those problems? The answer is quite simple. I have one final thought I want to share with you. I opened this afternoon by talking about this tsunami of complexity and uncertainty that's coming our way. And it can be quite frightening, specifically if you have an employee mindset. It can be terrifying. But the thought I want to leave you with is this. The world is overflowing with opportunities. It's never been a more opportunity-rich time than it is right now, right here in Mexico, in Latin America, for opportunities. All we need to do is understand and embrace an entrepreneurial mindset. Thank you.